This video is brought to you by Mack Weldon, a premium menswear essentials brand that believes in smart design and premium fabrics. For 20% off your first order, go to MacWeldon.com and use the promo code BRAINFOOD. For the uninitiated, cow tipping is a prank where a person sneaks up on a sleeping cow and pushes the animal over onto its side. Ask around and you will probably hear about a friend of a friend who successfully tipped a cow while out in the country late one night. The story generally recounts participants having a few alcoholic drinks before driving to a cow pasture and setting upon a slumbering bovine. But is it really possible? to tip a cow. Well, anything is possible, and humans are quite inventive, but in the way that cow tipping is generally depicted, no, it is not possible to tip a sleeping cow. The first issue here is that cows don't actually sleep while standing up, at least not in the way we tend to think of sleep. Cows do enter a sort of restful state while standing up, but while in this state, they are easily startled and are reasonably well aware of what's going on around them. Their deep sleep state occurs while they are already lying down, something they do for about 14 hours per day, with a few hours of that time being deep sleep. The rest of their time, they're either awake or in their light resting state. Another issue with the idea of sneaking up on a cow that is resting while standing is that at any given time in a herd of cattle, a number of the cows are wide awake. Cows may be largely domesticated animals today, but they still retain their flight instincts when they suspect a predator is nearby or observe others in the herd that appear startled by something. One cow will very quickly, via their behavior, alert the others in the herd if they hear or see anything suspicious, causing the others to in turn, become on edge and alert. Given a standing cow that is resting is very easily startled from its resting state, even without any other cows around, this makes the idea of sneaking up on one of these cows even more difficult, if not impossible. But let's say you and your friends manage to somehow park your car within walking distance of a cow without alerting it, harder than you think on a quiet country night, even parking a couple of miles away. Then you manage to hop the barbed wire fence and creep up to said cow without alerting it or any other cows in the herd via sound, sight, or scent. In that increasingly unlikely scenario, would you physically have the strength to tip over a cow? Dr. Margot Lilly and Tracy Boschler of the Zoology Department at the University of British Columbia conducted a study in 2005 to figure out the answer to that very question. Lilly and Boschler determined that it would take approximately 1,360 to 2,910 newtons of force applied at the optimal angle to tip over an average cow. For reference, an average fully grown Holston dairy cow typically weighs in at about 1,500 pounds, though this can vary by a few hundred pounds depending on a variety of factors. They then estimated that an average adult human could generate approximately 660 newtons of force at the optimal tipping angle. So, in theory, on the low end with a completely static cow, approximately two people could apply enough force to tip said static cow. The problem is that a cow would most certainly not stay static in such a scenario. And heaven help you if you tried to push over a 1,800 to 2,000 pound plus bull. And by the way, people generally don't survive being attacked by bulls, which is probably what would happen if you tried sneaking up on one and attempted to tip it over. So, on the high end, according to Dr. Lilly, overcoming the non-static cow's ability to brace itself would require, in the optimal scenario, around five people. But even if you did this, there is the fact that a cow in a state of falling is generally perfectly agile enough to simply catch itself and trot away. In the end, while it is technically possible for a group of humans to devise a way to cause a cow to tip over, it is, in the practical sense, impossible in the way generally illustrated when stereotypically inebriated individuals are described as tipping cows. So where did the idea of cow tipping actually come from? Unfortunately, the answer is that no one knows for sure. It has been hypothesized that the practice of attempting cow tipping probably came about via serving the same function as snipe hunting, sending a gullible individual out to perform some impossible task for the amusement of those in the know. 
Although it should be noted that this is a potentially very dangerous snipe hunting style game, particularly if there is a bull around in the herd. As for how this particular game entered the mainstream, stories of it began popping up in the late 20th century, and it particularly gained steam thanks to movies such as Heather's 1989 and Tommy Boy 1995, along with a season 4 episode of Beavis and Butthead titled Cow Tipping from 1994, where the duo failed in their attempt at tipping a horse, then were successful at tipping a cow which landed on Beavis. More recently, the 2006 Pixar film Cars depicts Mater and Lightning tipping cow-like tractors. Now look, maybe you don't believe me and you're thinking, Simon, please, I'm gonna go out and tip a cow right now. Well, let me say that if you do, you should be wearing clothes by Mac Weldon so that you can make a speedy exit as soon as you realize that you've made a terrible, terrible mistake. And I want to tell you about Mack Weldon before we get into today's bonus fact. So Mack Weldon, they make clothes from super premium fabrics and all of their stuff is super comfortable, it's super breathable, you can move around in it, but it's also smart. So I'm gonna try and stand up and show you like that. I, well, one, I do have legs. Uh, these are what are called radius pants. And what's so great about them is that they are both comfortable and pretty smart. Like I wear these to the office Pretty comfortable. Then there's also this sweater slash hoodie that I put on when it's a bit cold outside. And well, you know, it's January, so let's just say that I spend quite a bit of time in this thing. It's all ultra soft, it's ultra comfortable, and it's also ultra smell free. Uh, they produce these specific t-shirts and socks and underwear with silver in them. I got a t-shirt with silver in it. I wore it for eight days in the middle of summer and it didn't smell. Now I wear it like a normal person and it's still great. I love this stuff. Honestly, I used to just buy the cheapest uh, underwear, undershirts available because I was like, well, no one sees that stuff. But you know, since getting with Mack Weldon and since realizing that, oh, it's really better when it's comfortable, I, uh, I'm not going back. So just do it. It also supports the show. That's amazing. There is a link below or just go to MacWeldon.com. Use the code BRAINFOOD for 20% off. Just do it, it's great, and let's get into that bonus fact. Speaking of drunken dares, let us now introduce you to the amazing story of Thomas Fitzpatrick, known to his friends as Tommy Fitz. For the first part of this story, late in the evening, or rather early in the morning, on September the 30th, 1956, as Tommy was leaving a tavern on St. Nicholas Avenue in Manhattan to return home to New Jersey, Tommy bet one of his buddies he could make it back to the bar from New Jersey in a mere 15 minutes. This, of course, is impossible by car. So after leaving the bar on that September night, Tommy traveled to the Teterboro School of Aeronautics in New Jersey, where he stole a single-engine plane. Hoping to evade authorities until his return task was complete, he took off without lights at around 3 a.m. According to reports, his original plan was to land the plane at the field of George Washington High School, just a few blocks from the tavern. But since its lights weren't on that morning, a drunken Tommy chose to land the plane in front of the tavern itself on St. Nicholas Avenue near its intersection with 191st Street, managing to thread the needle, successfully avoiding lampposts and parked cars in his landing. Of course, landing a plane in the middle of a street in Manhattan is going to get you noticed, and the cops were called. Eventually charged with grand larceny, Tommy was never convicted since the plane's owner, presumably amused by the whole thing and with no harm done to his plane, refused to press charges. However, since the city's ordinances prohibited landing planes on its streets, Tommy was fined $100, about $800 today, and his pilot's license was suspended for six months. Just over two years later, again after imbibing at a Washington Heights bar, Tommy told the story of his first flight to fellow patrons of the bar. One of them then had the gall to question the authenticity of the story. His honor besmirched at about 1 a.m. on October the 4th, 1958, the inebriated Tommy went again to the Teterboro School of Aeronautics in New Jersey and borrowed a plane to fly back to New York City. This time, he landed the plane at the nearby intersection of Amsterdam and 187th Street. After landing the plane, he initially fled the scene. However, when police were called in and once again found themselves with a plane sitting in the middle of a Manhattan street and recalling the unique incident two years before a few blocks away, they decided to go investigate investigate and see if Mr. Fitz had something to do with this one too. At first, he reportedly denied it, but witnesses who saw him exit the plane and run off claimed it was him, ultimately inspiring Fitz to confess. He later succinctly summed up his decision-making paradigm in choosing to perform the feat again, stating, it's the lousy drink. With this second incident, there was no mercy. The magistrate judge Reuben Levy threw the book at him, saying, had you been properly jolted then, it's possible this would not have occurred a second time. The 
28-year-old Tommy Fitz was sentenced to six months in prison for transporting stolen property. Beyond his flying escapades and little stint in prison, Tommy Fitz had a full life, serving as a Marine in the Korean War and earning a Purple Heart, enjoying a 51-year marriage to his apparently understanding wife Helen, having three sons, working as a steam fitter, and living to the ripe old age of 79, dying in 2009. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and do not forget to subscribe. And don't forget to check out our wonderful sponsor, Mac Weldon. There is a link to them below. And thank you for watching.